a captivating dynamo of energy and inspiration, a unique keynote maestro and an esteemed London Business School guest lecturer, shaping the future of business with visionary leadership and unprecedented strategic insights. That is what you can read on Rick Vera's LinkedIn profile. But you can also get to know him as the grumpy old dude or the persona granddad. Rick is a business philosopher and a storyteller, just like me. And that's why our conversation is a lot about writing. So I hope you enjoy it. Welcome to the Own Your Story podcast, the place to learn about personality branding, thought leadership, and how to capitalize your reputation. In other words, how to own your story. I'm your host, Bianca Fleracas, former actress turned into six-figure entrepreneur, author, and keynote speaker. Let's get started. Okay, we're live. <laughs> Hi, Rick. Hi. <laughs> we are live. Yeah. Live? Are you sure? Yeah, we just sure had a final AI? countdown. Five, four, three, <laughs> two, one. We have a go. <laughs> yes. Um, final liftoff. Yeah, and, and this is um, rather a strange situation for us to to speak to one another because when we we see uh, we speak to one another, it's always live and it's not in such an official environment as a podcast recording. Uh, so Most maybe of the time we, we we do it walking. We yes. Talk, yes, or eating. Yeah. <laughs> and or eating, yeah. Yeah. So maybe we should give our audience this disclaimer that we are, yeah, you could say we are friends. And that yes. this discussion or this conversation we'll have might go off track. Might. Yeah. And and we agreed that you are the leader and I'm the follower and I don't know anything what's going to happen. Yeah. And I think yeah. um, I'm wondering. I hope if... that you know what's going to happen. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, of course. I know what, I know what I'm going to ask you. Okay. But yeah. I'm, I'm wondering if you can stay a follower because um, you want to be a leader as well. You don't like to follow huh? Sometimes okay. you do. I'll, 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 I'll do my You'll best. You'll see. Okay, I'll do my okay. best. So in, in, I, I invited you to be one of my uh, guests in this um, podcast because to me you represent several things and um, I want to talk to you about... <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I want to talk to you about the speakers industry and mm -hmm. uh, the, your personal brand and how mm -hmm. you deal with that. And also mm -hmm. with your um, intentions, not maybe not willingly, but I see this all the time. You you don't like to go with the flow. Uh, so no, the, no. <laughs> you disagree. Okay, fine. No, Let's no, no. Start. I don't like it. No, no. I I agree. I don't like to go with the flow. Yeah. 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 I see this. Yeah. In, well, in go with your flow. That's okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's okay. You'll have to anyway. Uh, first of all, where where are you now? Because you live an international life, you're all, you're often on the road. So where are you now? I'm at home or in my home studio, which is like 200 meters from where I live. Um, and I installed this studio during that period. We all know about COVID-19, mm -hmm. uh, where all of a sudden my complete fully booked agenda was like empty in, what was it, three mm -hmm. weeks time? Um, and so that gave me the opportunity to rethink what I was doing and to, yeah, um, start the studio. And, mm -hmm. um, for the moment, it's like only 5% of the keynotes are online, but I still like to go to the studio and, um, this is my writing place now for the moment. Yeah. So that surprises me. I thought there was still more of a percentage of, of online keynotes that we're giving after uh, the pandemic. You yeah, the first year there was like 80-20, 80% uh, mm -hmm. live and 20% online. But um, I've seen online almost completely disappearing. There's a number okay. of sessions I run for London Business School still online where companies um, save on cost to not fly everybody to London mm -hmm. and do an online session. And from time to time, there is an extra Q&A or um, an intake session that people say, okay, we don't do it um, live, we do it online. Um, and I love the online Q&As. You, you do a keynote, the keynote is you sent and the others are listening. 
And I don't like a Q&A after a keynote because that's always hijacked by one or two people that uh, are asking mm -hmm. a question that lasts for like 15 minutes, which is not a question, but a statement. And then, mm -hmm. yes. then, it, yeah, then it's a shame of my time and of their time. But I love the online Q&As afterwards. And yeah. that's what we do from time to time as well. Now, you are known as a speaker who travels international to, to give uh, keynotes in US and, and I don't know if you often vis, uh, visit Asia, but how is it for you to um, to combine that international career with working from your home office and give online keynotes there? Um, yeah, it's, it's always biased. Uh, you, you have a biased attitude versus the international travel. When I'm not traveling, I miss it. And when I'm traveling, I miss home. Mm -hmm. um, and when I'm constantly at home, then it starts to become boring. And when I'm constantly <laughs> traveling, it starts to become tiring. So yes. I love the combination. Um, I love to come home. I love to leave home like something I'm, I'm leaving, but I, I will be back. Um, so I need that, you know, that, 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 that ground, something that grounds you, that grounds me mm -hmm. where I feel at home, um, where I can become, where I feel the, the yep, where I, where I find my, my peace, but at the same time, my restlessness, um, yeah. And so then I need to travel again. And then traveling is nice. When you travel all the time, it's no longer nice. Traveling is quite tiring. Um, but when I'm not traveling, I miss it. It's as simple as that. It's, mm -hmm. um, you need both. And it's not a balance. It's, uh, it's an unbalanced balance. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I understand. Yeah, now sorry, we... <laughs> but that's what it is. Yeah, yeah it is. It is. Yeah. And, and, and it's, it's like you only know um, what you're missing and how it feels to be home exactly when, yeah when you leave if you stay home yeah. all the time when you're constantly at home that's why i needed the studio as well during covid 19 because the, the first online session i did from a, a small room somewhere in the house but then you're still in the house mm -hmm. um and now only it's only like 200 meters so it's a five minute walk but it's a five mm -hmm. minute walk you walk yeah. out of home and you come to the studio and then you leave the studio and you walk back home and even yeah. that five minute walk is enough to yeah, yeah to come home again. And and yeah. is that your your workout every day? Five yeah. minutes walk? <laughs> That's it. Yeah. People you know, when I do a keynote and I I'm I'm I like to have and you know that, I like to have a high pace during my keynote mm -hmm. um for a number of reasons. And um after or during a keynote I get a a sign um, from my watch that I'm that it, it congratulates me that I'm doing a workout. <laughs> really? Yeah, really. You yeah, burn enough well calories. Done. Job well done. Job <laughs> well done. <laughs> yeah. So that's my workout. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, but, but that's something people don't realize how much energy it costs to to perform on a stage and give all that energy. Yeah, but I'm yeah, you're an actress, so, so you know all about it. It's it's yeah. your breathing. You have to control yeah. your breathing. You have to control your text. Uh, you have to watch the ocean, uh, the the ocean, the audience. Mm -hmm. Watching the ocean is part of my keynote. So you see, <laughs> the, the very moment you, the, there's a couple of words, and yeah. the rest quite automatically so it comes out of your mind. So. Um, that's that's uh, the way Jenny works. That's, that's yeah, but Gen quite AI a lot. Works. Yeah, that's exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but that that is also part of your keynote is ingrained in your brain, mm -hmm. um, and because it's ingrained in your brain, and people underestimate how much rehearsals that takes. Mm -hmm. But because it's part of of your brain, you can release part of your brain towards the ocean. Uh, again, the ocean sea, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the yeah, yeah. audience towards the the audience, and to interact with the audience. Yeah. So um, that there's a lot that you need to focus on at the same time. You have to split up your brain in at least three parts mm -hmm. and keep them separately, and the, and you know what I'm talking about. The worst that can happen to you, and it only happens like once a year, you don't get into the flow mm -hmm. and you start to think about the flow. And that's the one thing that a keynote speaker should never do. Think about what you're doing. Mm 
while you're doing mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. um, and it only happens like once every year. It's not working with, with the audience or, you know, you have that bad day and luckily yeah. that's that's very limited and nobody and notices no. besides yourself yeah but that awful moment when you start to think about the keynote that you're giving that yeah, what, yeah <laughs> what am i doing and you start to get out of yourself and look upon yourself while yeah. you're presenting yeah. that's that's and, and how do you day. yeah how do you fix that or you just be mindful of it and yeah that's it yeah. um you know how you fix it? That's one of the few times I take a deep breath, take a pause, um, take a, a sip of water and start, not all over again because you have to resume, but mm -hmm. I resume. So get mm -hmm. out of that not finding my flow for like five seconds or even maybe 20 seconds, mm -hmm. pause and resume. And yeah. then in most of the cases, it, you're back in the flow. Yeah. yeah. For me, it's, it's uh, focusing on the story, only on the story. So what, what am I here to yeah. tell? That's yeah. it. Yeah. And just, um, yeah. Yeah. And just that, do it. that, especially when, when you do a long one and I did a long one, um, this week and I don't like to work with the mic if it's not necessary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when you the, handheld. When, you mean a handheld? Yeah, uh, yeah. Also with with the with the headset. If it's really? not necessary, it yeah, huh? it 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 distance you from the audience. Um, okay. So I I if I can do it, and if I have the feeling, okay, my voice can do this. Mm -hmm. um, I like to do it with, without, without any. Without a mic. Yeah. Without a mic, but you know, from time to time, that is edgy, mm -hmm. um, because. Um, when you have to raise your voice, mm -hmm. there's an extra effort that you need to do because mm -hmm. your, your breathing even becomes more important because you need more breath mm -hmm. um, for the same number of words because you have mm -hmm. to speak louder and that takes more yeah. breath and more yeah. energy. And then to yeah. keep the energy going for like, and this was a 90-minute keynote for 90 minutes, yeah. I can tell you after 60 yeah. minutes, you have that little dip. Yeah. And um, that's also a, it's a, a quite frightening moment for like, and that, that lasts for like 30 seconds or a minute yeah. and then you're back on track. Yeah. Um, but that for also me, is something that can happen. Yeah. For me, the, um, as an actor, the, I think most part of my career, um, actors didn't use any microphones. So there were no headsets, yeah. etc. So, uh, we were trained to use our voice and to project it into the, into the audience and make sure yeah. that the, the last row could, could hear you. But yeah. of course, most of the time you're in a venue, uh, in a theater. So where the, the acoustics are created that way. Now, not, not all yeah. of them. So, and as a, a female voice, it's, it's harder to, to reach the end of, of, uh, the audience yeah. because we yeah. don't have any, uh, the, the, the ba um, bus bass bus the lower <laughs> tones <laughs> we don't have them yeah, as much yeah, yeah. so it's uh you have the tendency as a woman to 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 shout to, to shout much more easier yeah. and the, the the difference um at the end of my career that changed i think maybe due to the musicals etc because they all were wearing uh, wearing a headset so they started yeah. to, to to give actors headsets as well and when you are able to work with a microphone, you can use much more subtilities in, uh, you can be more subtle in, in your voice and give yeah. more uh, um, uh, meaning and, and uh, tone yeah. of voice. And, yeah, and you, you can be, you, you can alter your tone much yes, more. It's, I, yeah, I so, agree. yeah, but on the other so hand, I don't understand why really... you don't like to use a microphone. Oh, um, you know, you, you kind of, um, you really blow energy into the room and you get energy back. Well, I um, do not agree uh, because I, yeah. I, I, yeah, okay. I can yeah. you, be, you can have a more um, you know, eco-friendly way. Is that moment? Of, of, yeah, no, no. When is that moment? Um, then I realized that the people in the first one, two, four, five roles mm -hmm. hear a double voice. They hear your voice and they hear the voice. Yeah. 
yeah, yeah. The, yeah, it's, uh, because, yeah, yeah. technically it's not always uh, always correct, of course. Yeah. Um, but nevertheless, so, it um, I, I, li I like to use no mic when it's not necessary. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And from time to time, it is like ooh, okay, edgy. Yeah. You weren't a, a keynote speaker all of your career. So was, there was this period, this time, nobody knows that anymore, I think, because you are now, you are a speaker and that's who you are. Oh, there's ma still many people that remember my former life. Okay. I had colleagues so and people it. working with and for me, so they still know me. Okay, so yeah. tell, me, uh, tell us about it. What were you? What did you do before you, you started your speaker's career? Um, I was in business being... First of all, in business and then leading businesses. Um, and I soon found out that one of the most important elements in business, and especially when you try to lead a business, is storytelling. So mm -hmm. I've always loved storytelling. I've always been the type of leader that turned difficult messages or even engaging messages into a storyline. Mm -hmm. um, and either it was, I, I don't like, um, and storylines were not like, oh, let's invent a story and let's pretend it's mine. But it was more like um, when you talk, when, when, when you share fairy tales, um, you, you make up a story and you tell people, look, this is a parallel. This is not a real story, but it's a story that will allow you to understand better what I'm talking about. Yeah, metaphors. Or I've always loved to refer to books or movies that people knew and that I said, look at this movie or like this book and read it another way and see the parallel with our business. So I've always been into storytelling, never like I want to be a storyteller, more like I need to accomplish what I need to accomplish. And the best way to accomplish that is by sharing stories with people. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember at a certain moment we were bought by Americans and I thought I was a pretty good storyteller. And then I had a sales meeting. I was a sales manager and um, my CEO, American CEO, joined the meeting. And um, I had a feeling I was running a very good meeting. And at the end of the meeting, he came to me and he said, this was lousy. <laughs> this was crap. <laughs> And I was shocked um, because I saw people leaving the room and I had a good feel about it, but he said it, it, it was crap. Um, and so um, he said, your storytelling is good, but it's not good enough. Um, and so he sent me on a course in the United States. So I followed a, a one-week course in storytelling in the United States. And I have to be honest, I don't apply everything I've learned there because there's a lot of flow. And as you said, I don't like to go with the flow, but there's so many elements that I took out of that and that I'm still using. Um, and one of the things that struck me was also, he said, you're building it up the, right, the wrong way. Um, you, you, the, the highlight of your meeting is somewhere in the middle of the meeting and you end the meeting with the worst that you can do are there any questions um don't ever end a meeting with are there any questions because any questions is people go all directions and the, the, you miss the highlight so you have to have the highlight at the end of the meeting and that's never are there any questions because when there are so many questions people you know it's it's to go all directions and maybe you cannot answer all the questions and questions are reasons why to do or to not do stuff. So don't ever end your meeting with questions. Now I was raised in European way. So all meetings I've been seeing um, since, uh, uh, until that moment. And I've seen so many meetings afterwards where I was not leading the meeting that end with questions. And he was the first that told me, don't ever to stop do. with questions. Stop with your highlight of the day. Stop with, end with what you want them to remember when they walk out. Yeah. So That's why I end all my keynotes with homework. 
difficult. Something to I want them to remember. Yeah. 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 And, and is that is that the moment you you thought about um, becoming a keynote speaker and made that your no 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 not at model? all. That was that was pretty much by accident. Um, um, after that career, we, we, we sold the company. We sold a company where I was leading the company to Dolty Hansen in 2009. And uh, for a number of reasons, you know, contract, I needed to get out of the business for a while. And while I was out of the business, I, I was planning to go back into the business I've been, I had been into for like 20 years. So that's your, you know, that's your habitat. You want to go mm -hmm. back to your habitat. Uh, but in that period, um, Microsoft in the Netherlands, because I had been responsible for uh, headquarters in the Netherlands, Microsoft in the Netherlands asked me, hey, Rick, can you come and help us um, to be the bridge in between technology and um, business and business and technology? Because as a business leader, you've always been a challenging user of technology so you're not just using technology but you challenge what you can do with technology you challenge us um, to really help you and to really move you to the next level um, and we know what technology can do but we have business leaders that are not aware what technology can do for them and then they're asking us to do something and we know we can do much more so can you be the in-between so i started to do that and um, i had a pretty large room at Microsoft in the Netherlands where three of the four walls were white walls. So I did whiteboard sessions. And the first couple of whiteboard sessions, I started with nothing. But then you start to realize, oh, I need to do a short introduction to get them into the mood before we actually can start this whiteboard session. And the whiteboard session was dream your impossible dream and there were a couple of microsoft people in the room and as long as they were doing this i knew okay i can continue the very moment i saw that they were like mm, mm -hmm. then i knew okay now i have to cut this dream and, and move to another direction so that's what i did but um i started to realize i need to do an introduction so i started to make a short powerpoint presentation and an introduction to introduce what we were going to do and that start with five minutes and after a couple of weeks or a couple of months, that was like half an hour um, introduction. And then Microsoft said, wow, this is, this is amazing. Can you do it on a larger stage? And um, the first time I did it was on a stage with a couple of thousand people. By the way, I'm going to do that very same session um, in next um, Tuesday, oh, I can't, okay, you're going to send it out later so I can, <laughs> I can share it because I'm, I'm the mystery guest. So I, I, I cannot disclose it yet, but I'm going to do the same session. And that was my very first public speaking um, session, not yeah. in my own company, not for customers, not for my own customers, not for my own people, but for external people. And I remember going off stage, calling my wife and saying, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. Really? Yeah. Yeah. So it, it kind of happened by accident. Yeah. So you yeah. just rolled into it. But a lot of people uh, that I'm working with anyway um, are in kind of the same situation. They've been working in a company for years. They're had their... Um, they had a certain level of management and, and then they, they want to move towards that. They want to become the keynote speaker they want to become mm -hmm. the consultant they want to do it on their own but they really decided it. yeah it's a real it's yeah. a decision um i would have never decided it i wouldn't have i wouldn't have thought about it yeah yeah but maybe maybe because it's no offense but it's it's a couple of years ago how long are you a speaker by now 10 years 20 this years? Uh, what i'm now talking about the, 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 this first I call it the gig. This first gig must have mm -hmm. been, sorry, um, this first gig must have been 2012, so um, oh, okay. 10, 11 years. Yeah. 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 So maybe public speaking wasn't that hot as it is now. now it no, seems like, not at all. Not at all. Now it seems like I, I, didn't, I didn't know, I, 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 until that moment, I didn't even know that this yeah. was something that you could do for a living. Yeah, I never thought about that. Ah, that's, that's, that's and they were that's like interesting too because if, I, I, if I, I compare started... it with 
with, with the actual market, there must have been yeah. like 10 or 15 keynote speakers on the, in the Dutch market. Now there are mm. like 1,500 or maybe 2,000 keynote yeah. speakers on the Dutch market. Yeah, yeah, it's incredible. Yeah. I, I started um, coaching speakers in 2012. I think P yeah. Peter Hinzer was the first first speaker I was coaching. Did I know yeah. who Peter Hinzer was? Um, but... Um, Ah, I didn't. I didn't realize that or so. It wasn't that. I didn't. I didn't hot. know Peter didn't... or Stephen in 2012. I've never. I've, I've never thought about it. I met Peter yeah. and Stephen for the first time in 2015, for yes, yeah. a Microsoft uh, for a Microsoft yeah. event. Yeah. Wow. And now it has really boosted, and it seems like when you when you look at LinkedIn profiles everyone's an author everyone's a speaker <laughs> nowadays yeah um yeah. it changed quite a lot in those 10 years absolutely yeah. yeah yeah um so you already talked about how you how much work you put into um studying your keynote um, making your slides and making your yeah. slides and yeah but your you're slides. a real slide geek yeah there are a lot of speakers who just create one slideshow and that's it and and when yeah. we join when we are on stage together most of the time i'm a host and you're the speaker uh, uh, even two minutes before you get on stage you're still <laughs> tweaking those last slides making the technical crew i make people <laughs> yeah i make the technical people <laughs> crazy yeah absolutely and not only the technical people also yeah. the organizers from time to time yeah sorry yeah. for that yeah so you, but you, you know you're sitting there you see everything. other speakers do something a ceo cto and then you say oh I, I need to use this um mm -hmm. and oh that there, there, there's there's a slide i can i or there's a loop i can i can put into my slide deck and mm -hmm. but if i put in a loop i have to take out another loop yes. because yes. my time is limited um so you start to shuffle and reshuffle your slides until the very last minute yeah absolutely yeah but you can handle that because it, for me, no, no, I'm not. I'm, that's not true. I also change stuff. Oh, you uh, can handle couple. that as well. Yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it's it's stress anyway. It's uh, you don't make it easy for yourself when you do that. No, you don't make it easy for yourself. And that last minute is also a way to really get into the flow. Um, mm -hmm. The flow already starts before you're actually on stage. You're mm -hmm. already performing, literally performing before you get on stage. So um, I don't make I won't make it easy on myself because I never ever do the same keynote twice. Yeah, and that means that um, if I do and, and there's weeks I do ten, eleven, twelve keynotes on a weekly basis. Um, that means that it's not only performing the keynotes, but mm -hmm. it's also making the slide decks. And sometimes you get 30 minutes, sometimes you get 35 minutes, sometimes you get 45 minutes, sometimes you get an hour, sometimes you get 90 minutes. Um, sometimes the the industry is, is the banking industry, is the insurance industry. Yeah. Um, companies are on a different level, um, on a different point in their journey. Um, it's a different audience from time to time. It's internal people from time to time. It's external people, it's customers, it's shareholders. So I adjust all the time. And that means that if you do 11 keynotes or mm -hmm. even more on a weekly basis, that means also at least 11, uh, 11 or 12 hours, at least that yes. you have to put into preparing those slide decks yes. and, and, and remembering them and, and, getting off stage and doing another one like four or five hours later or sometimes yeah. two hours later, yeah. which is completely different. Yeah, and, and you're only mentioning the uh, changing slide decks, et cetera, but you also have to do the research to keep up with what's happening yeah. in the world with those companies, et cetera. So organizers do not realize how much work it, it all takes to, to reach a, a certain level when you're a keynote speaker. They in my opinion they often see it as oh we have this great venue we have a great catering and oh we also need someone on stage who, says, yeah. who, who talks about serious things and 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 entertains our audience and that's it but it it's if you're playing on a high level as as a speaker you this is a tough job to to differentiate yourself yeah but uh, from yeah others. i know i know yeah i know very engaging good speakers that travel the world with the same keynote and I don't have anything against it. I mean, mm -hmm. 
it, it's not negative or positive. It is different. And from time to time, I wish I could be like that, but I am who I am. And mm -hmm. it would bore me to death that, yeah. <laughs> to, to, that I would do the same keynote yeah. time and, and time this again. Is, and, and you are giving me the perfect bridge towards yeah, the you. next topic, personal branding, because that is, of course, you're not the only one talking about the stuff you're talking about and, 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 no. and um, uh, yeah, making, making, uh, giving highlights to the ecosystem and, 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 and saying you, you need to do it, look into that as a business, etc. So mm. you need to differentiate yourself. And in my opinion, the biggest differentiator is who you are your personality and oh, that's, yeah, absolutely. that sounds like yeah. a cliche and and people say yeah i just need to be who i am no that just being yourself means to me being lazy it takes more it takes more being yourself being a personality takes more and it's a weird combination of accepting who you are but really living it really daring to show it and that is something i uh, see you doing yeah, from time to time, it's it's not easy, just as you mentioned, because it is not very political if you are yourself all the time. Um, you're not selling ice cream. You're not making mm -hmm. everybody as happy as you may be. You won't. I mean, I, I like to make people happy, um, but that is not the same as I like to please everybody. Mm -hmm. um, I and and you're absolutely right. The content I'm talking about, there's nothing special about the content. There's so many people that talk about the same content, but it's the way you bring the content and the mm -hmm. way you engage with the audience. And I've learned that um, the more you are, or the closer you are to you to to who you are. Um, and on one hand, that's easy, and on the other hand, that's not easy. Um, it especially take it takes guts to be close to yourself. Um, mm -hmm. um, I wouldn't be able to, to, to do that like 20 years ago. Um, maybe because I didn't exactly know, I still don't know who exactly I am. It's still, mm -hmm. I'm looking for, you know, it's some, you're constantly discovering more about yourself while you're doing it. And it's like, I, I like to compare it also with, with how you build a company, it's, it's cathedral building. Um, you don't have a grand plan, you just start building. And while you're building, you discover new building techniques. And then you say, mm -hmm. okay, that might be interesting. And let's, let's give it a try. And if it works, it works. And if it doesn't work, okay, I tried it and it doesn't work. But to enable yourself to do this trial and error in real life, um, on stage with an audience, um, and it's not only on stage with an audience, but it's also how you use social media in exactly the same way. Yeah. Be very open. Um, and I can write an article today and like in two, month, in two months time, I have another opinion about the same topic. I'm not afraid to change my opinion. Um, yeah. And now the book I'm writing, I'm even putting that into my book. I write a chapter and then I've created two persona talking about the chapter um, and from time to time I make a joke of this chapter I've just written because you can mm. also joke with it I mean yeah of course <laughs> don't take it too seriously it's not it's not it's not the truth it is one aspect of a potential yeah. truth and daring to do that is something I needed to learn as well yeah. it doesn't so, it didn't came just like no. because you don't do this I didn't do this in corporate life you don't do this in corporate life yeah i think a lot of people don't do that it, it, for me it's it's um, stating that um you need to be you need to be yourself uh people um but that's it's that's not enough because it creates it's like the word authentic it creates laziness <laughs> Authenticity yeah. creates. Well, I'm authenticity okay, I'm okay. is a self-destructing world. Yeah. Word. If so the I, very I, moment you you need to be authentic, you're yeah. no longer authentic. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So so uh, um, uh, and, and I see people <laughs> that reacting on that statement of of mine and and are really happy. I'm just being me. Yeah. But but are you interesting enough if you're just just you, um, and uh, not putting yourself out there and and. 
really um, stand for the things you stand for. So take us with us, take us, um, give us an example of something you, uh, how you acted or thought years ago and that have changed because you've found out more about yourself, something that you've put out in the world more extreme, more clearly, um, and that would not be liked by everyone because that's the thing. You don't need to be liked by everyone. No, but it, it's, uh, I've been, I already said I've been a business leader and I started to be a business leader in the 90s. I'm an old guy. In the 90s, leadership was different. So you're mm -hmm. also part of the context. And um, the 90s was like, was power leadership. Mm -hmm. um, it was like, you needed to be, you know, it's it's a time of the UPs. You, you needed to be hard and driven and ruthless. And I was maybe not the most ruthless of them all, but that's the context. So, yeah. um, and you, even when, when you went against the stream, you went against the stream, but the stream was different than the stream today. So I was maybe not as ruthless as all my colleagues, but if I would be taken out of that context and be the same person right now, you would call me extremely ruthless and hard and emotionless. Yeah. Um, so it, it's also part of the context. The, the 90s were different than the zeros and were yeah. different than the tens. So do you mean you are still adapting yourself towards the context you're performing in or living you, you, in? You don't, you don't do it on purpose, but we're all part of a context. And we're mm -hmm. all, um, you, you can't deny that because you live in a context and at the same time you are the context. People don't realize that you're not only part of the context, but yet you are also, um, you're not only, um, the context is not only defining you, but to some extent, we're all defining the context as well. Yeah. So, so what's your context um, right now? Because I, I want to make this concrete. Because, because my, my, my context right now is, but, but my context is I'm no longer attached to a company. I'm only attached to what I do, which gives me quite a lot of freedom. Mm -hmm. um, the freedom that I, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm, I'm a lucky bastard, you know, sorry. Um, I'm a lucky bastard because... I can do whatever I want. Um, I get an audience. People listen to me. Um, I get an applause at the end of what I do. Um, most people do an amazing job and never get an applause. I do a good job and I get an applause. At, not even at the end. Most of the time, even before I start, um, you write something on LinkedIn and it might be absolute crap, but people read it and you get reactions. So I have the luck to be able to be interactive with a lot of people. And when you're interactive with a lot of people, you get so much information, you get so much, uh, as, at least as if, if you're open for it. Every time people challenge what you do, people challenge what you've just written. When you do an intake call for yet another keynote that you want to adjust to exactly the company and adjust to exactly the audience, you learn something. And I have the luck that I'm able to learn all the time because I don't have to translate it into some business context. I can just translate it into what I do with it and how mm -hmm. I translate it to an audience and create impact because I'm well aware that every time you're on stage, every time you write something, you have impact. And that impact doesn't need to be big or huge, but you have impact. And that's, I think, the most rewarding that people can have. Mm -hmm. That is that you're not just undergoing the context, but that you're also influencing the context in some way or another. Yeah. But you also are also bold enough to, to make bold statements and um, to appear on stage in a non non-conventional way. For me, you're, mm -hmm. you, you look, sometimes you look like a cowboy to me. <laughs> <laughs> you got this look and feel of a cowboy. How do you, the way you dress, the way you act, your shoes, the way. Um, so that's that's for me. That's your that's your personal brand. That is Rick, and it's it's clear. And and you make a statement with that. And and the way you you pose things, <clears throat> you put things into the world. You say, I think it's like that, and you should be doing that or not or whatever. Um, so, dare to be bold is. 
for me is something people should dare more and then figure out if it works, if they have a context that uh, or an audience that wants to listen to them. But it's something, it's something you do. You're not uh, afraid yeah, of being and, bold. Yeah, and my, I've got one judge for the moment, one that can say to me, okay, this is good and this is no good. Mm -hmm. and that's my 18-year-old that? or my 17-year-old self. <laughs> Why? That's, that's, yeah, it, 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 a couple of years ago, I started to realize I am pretty, I'm, I'm, I'm back to who I was at 16, 17, 18 years old. When, when I would have seen myself, just imagine I go back to being 17 and I look at who I was when I was 35 or 40 or 45, when mm -hmm. I was really the CEO of large organizations, I would have said, this is not me. Yeah, this is this is not is this who I became? That's not mm -hmm. me. I'm pretty sure that when I would ask that question to my 17 year old now, and when he would see what I was doing, he would say, "This is what I, I'd never dreamt about this, but yeah, yeah, yeah. this is this is it, yeah." Um, and you know, I I even kind of dressed the same way as I dressed when I was 17. I still love my T-shirts. I love my jeans. I still wear my yeah, converse, yeah, yeah. the same converse I was wearing when I was that age. And I, I didn't do it on purpose. It was not something I said, oh, now I want to go back to 17-year-old. But at a certain moment, I was writing, and I'm still writing that book, which is my the book I hope to have finished one day, and it's the working title is Letters, Letters to My Grand Grandchildren. So mm -hmm. I'm writing this, I'm imagining I'm 19 years old and I'm writing, no, I, I imagine that I'm writing letters that I'm going to read in 30 years when I'm 90 years old and sitting together with my grand grandkids. Um, and so w when I was writing that, I was also writing about my first 30 years on this planet and the next 30 years. And then I'm writing about the next 30 years. I'm writing about those first 30 years. I all of a sudden started to realize, oh, but I'm pretty close to who I was in those first 20 years of my life. And to you, that's a good thing. Because yeah, I love it. Yeah. Yeah. But, but, but you know, Working hard in between has given me um, the freedom mm -hmm. to be and to be able to be who I am for the moment. So I, I'm lucky. Um, I'm not saying that people that are not as close to who they were when they were 15, 16, 17 did something wrong. I was mm -hmm. lucky enough to be in this situation. Um, and I don't blame myself for being somebody else when I was 35 or 40 or 45, because when I look back, that was part of life. Yeah. Um, and not everybody is as lucky um, to have this type of job and to have this type of freedom. Yeah. And so, so, so I don't, who, who I don't look at, at. Who are you as a, as a 16, 17 year old? So. I, I want to, to do become, the exercise myself. So I take. Who I want. I wanted. I wanted. It's very clear when 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 you would meet people that were in my and they're still alive. I mean, mm -hmm. <laughs> the people that were with me in my in my classroom, or even with my teachers, when you would have asked, when you would meet them and ask them, okay, seventeen-year-old Rick, what would he? What would you have thought that he would become? Then they would have said a writer or a painter or an artist in some way or another. Yeah. Because that's what, that's what I not only dreamt of, but that's what I wanted to be. Absolutely yeah. wanted to be because that's what I felt. This is okay. why I'm here. Um, yeah. And then really by accident, you, you, you end up in business life, maybe because you don't fit there. You become very good at it um, because I've always been creative. I've always been um, passionately curious. And maybe that has helped me to become very good in corporate life. 
Yeah. Um, but it was not close to myself. Yeah. I was using my skills for something completely different yeah. than what I thought that the skills would help me for. And now I'm using the same skills, but it's way closer to who I actually am. But again, I don't blame people that don't have the opportunity to do exactly the same because mm -hmm. I have been fortunate from time to time. I remember when I was a kid, um, and I'm sharing something I've, I've never shared before, but that's, that always happens with you. Um, when I was a kid, I, I, was, I was the eldest grandson of my, um, my grandma. My grandma, you know, when the eldest grandson, you are the favorite, yeah? Okay, so I was her favorite. And I remember every New Year's Eve, um, she came to me and she said, I don't have a present for you. You don't need presents. You are born under a lucky star. Um, whatever you want and whatever you wish is going to happen. And I have that feeling, to be honest. Mm -hmm. She was right. Mm -hmm. Nice. But I've never shared this, so. Yeah, yeah I had that. Um... I had the, this publisher saying the s same kind of thing to me once, and I laughed at him. And um, and uh, and afterwards, I had to agree with him. But if I look back at my sixteen or seventeen year old, and I yeah. ask this, my my uh, uh, the people around me, what did you think that I would do? Um, then I I did what I did what I wanted to do so so I, it, I didn't it didn't take me 20 years to become a writer or or an artist i just i just got started with it yeah <laughs> and yeah. uh so i became what people thought i would became uh, uh yeah. not because they wanted that because i was listening to them it just it was just it was my path um but I also always felt that it's just a path that leads to other places as well. Um, and to me, it was, I wanted to find out how you tell stories and how do you move people from one place in their life to another without yeah. being a psychologist. Um, and I was intrigued how you can um, influence and impact people by telling stories in different kind of ways and i do remember that the first my first gig for for um uh, a belgian broadcast when i was i was uh, 11 years old and um it was a time where as a kid if you worked uh, you, you didn't get paid you didn't get money so i had to choose a present and yeah. i chose a typewriting machine wow a because you wanted to be a writer as well. Because yeah. I wanted to become a writer. Yeah. And then um, when I was 18, I was doubting. I wanted to become an actor, but I also wanted to do journalism. And I chose to be an actor because I was already into the, into the industry. But the writing was always there. And now <laughs> I've written you this. You know why I stopped to be book. a writer? <laughs> yeah. Sorry? You know why I stopped to be a writer? Stopped? I wrote... No. I wrote, a, yeah, I wrote, I, I had this dream. I wanted to write a real, a real novel mm -hmm. before I'm 20. So I wrote, and I was like 18 or 19 on an old typewriter, my dad's typewriter. I wrote a novel. Um, mm -hmm. And um, it was like, you know, this thick, all hand typed. And, um, I put it in an envelope and um, I send it to Jeroen Brouwers. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Send it to Jeroen Brouwers. Wow. This is this is my manuscript. That's a lot of good. Yeah, and um, it came back mm. uh, with a letter, and it came back really, really. Um, it was bloody because oh. he had been adjusting and making notes on every single page, but every single page was wow. read. Yeah. Um, this is no good. You have to write this. This should be there, you know, all that stuff. But I was 18. And for me, time. that was like, 
Yeah, but yeah, exactly. But I didn't realize it that yeah. mo- at that moment. So uh, the only thing I th- I saw was it's you ruined it. Yeah. You ruined it. It was it was crap. I didn't realize at that moment that all the time he had put into reading mm-hmm. every single page and making adjustments yeah. to every single page, and there was a letter. And I only wrote, I only read the negative in that letter because I had this dream and I wanted to be that, you know, I didn't want to win the Nobel Prize, but maybe I even wanted to win win the Nobel Prize. That's what you do when you're 18, you know, your Mm -hmm. dreams are huge. And that letter was a disappointment. And so I stopped writing. Um, And when we moved houses in 2005, um, and we came to live in the house that we live in today, uh, I was moving boxes <laughs> and I rediscov- rediscovered the manuscript oh, wow. and I redisco- rediscovered the the letter. And, you know, it's, um, uh, what is it, 40 years later? Oh, yeah, 40 years, almost 40 years later. And all of a sudden I started to realize, oh, shit, um, he, that letter was a recommendation. That letter was like, wow. Um, and so that gave me the, the guts at that moment to resume writing. Mm-hmm. Strange, no? Wow, beautiful, yeah. beautiful story. But I think you're, you're, and I think you realize that yourself as well, you're much more of a writer than, than the books you have published. You have only published two books. Haven't you two books? Two, two books, or, yeah. But I'm, I'm, I'm still writing on that. Um, yeah, but you're constantly that, that 30, 30, that, that's 30. What I mean. Yeah, that's what I mean. I see you constantly mentioning that you're writing this new book, writing this new book, and it's, <laughs> it seems like it's never going to get published. What is holding you back from really publishing more? Um, yeah, what is holding you back? T- time. There's so much time that goes into keynotes yes, it, that yeah. the the writing, I write all the time and I write a lot, but there's a difference between writing and writing a book um, mm-hmm. to, to put all what I'm writing into something that looks like a book because you need chapters and you need to, you build it up. Um, and that takes time um, and time and energy. And for the moment it's making choices and the choice is, okay, I... Um, I'm 60. Um, mm-hmm. I don't know how long I can keep on living the life I lead for the moment, to be honest. Yeah. Um, yeah. I've just had three crazy weeks, and I can tell you after three crazy weeks, I get tired. <laughs> mm-hmm. My body says, hey, um, mm-hmm. there's no country for an old man. Um, mm-hmm. So I don't know how long I'm going to be able to do this. I know that... Um, when I'm a little bit lucky, um, there's another 30 years ahead of me that I can use for writing yeah. and no longer for this crazy life of traveling the world and doing my keynote. So yeah. it's a matter of choice. Yeah, you, you announced it uh, earlier this year that you've become <laughs> 16 and yeah. you still have uh, how much? Well, I forgot the, the amount. Three hundred. I said 500, <laughs> which is which is... Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah so That's you it. started a I'm, countdown, I'm, and I claimed yeah. I claimed at least ten keynotes together with you on stage, <laughs> which yeah. we still have to m- make it. A we reality. have to find an occasion there. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> we have to, we yeah. have to find an occasion. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so you, you're in this mindset. Okay, I'm in this transformation towards another part of my my life, and uh, I don't know where it starts or where it's, the other one ends, etc. But you also have this, um, how should I call it, um, an al- alter ego? Is that correct? Mm-hmm. In English? Yeah. yeah. So you you sometimes use God, uh, the grumpy, grumpy, old old, dude. Yeah. grumpy old dude, and uh, you have a, a second one this year, uh, the grandfather, uh, which you are, of, yeah. of course. But it's kind of a persona the- you are creating. Um, and 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 why why did you start with a grumpy old dude? Is it to give yourself a permission to, <laughs> yeah, to be grumpy, <laughs> to kick around, yeah, to be grumpy and to kick around and to, um, 
you know, I have this, I, I can be very sarcastic about society and people. And at the same time, I love people and I love society. Um, and if you, if you split it up, even when you're writing in, in characters, it makes it easier to take different positions. Um, mm -hmm. And so in the book I'm writing, I'm taking three characters that um, comment on um, what I'm writing. So there's four characters. There's the, the neutral writer, that is the author. And mm -hmm. then you have the 17-year-old me, um, um, the, 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 the grandfather, very positive, very hopeful. And you have grumpy old dude that... Mm -hmm. is a negative one and the negative one and that says okay it's all nice this dream but yeah, uh, yeah. reality shows something else yeah. and it's nice to do that because it's reality is a combination of the three i'm, mm -hmm. I'm always flabbergasted when people talk about the future that they are either they, they choose for the utopy or the um, dystopy you, you never see i mean we live in the future for the moment. I mean, like when you talk about the 60s, this is the future of the 60s. Mm -hmm. And in the 60s or the 70s, when people would talk about 2020, it would be the either utopic or dystopic. It's neither. Mm -hmm. uh, but when we talk about the future, we do exactly the same. We're going to see a utopic future or we're going to see a dystopic future. The future is going to be neither utopic, neither dystopic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's going to be just like today, a combination of quite a lot. Yes, it's going to be different. And at the same time, it's not going to be that different. I mean, the world is not that different from the 60s. Um, the world is not that different from the 70s. And it's certainly not utopic or dystopic. Yeah, yeah. But why do we do that? <laughs> and we keep doing that. So by creating this persona, I can try to think about what the world would look like in, 20, in 2053, mm -hmm. because that's the world I'm describing in some of the chapters, and look at it from those three, four, five Point points of view. Of view. Yeah. yeah. Now, the, the, the grandfather persona, that one kicked in, I think, a year. Uh, yeah. And I think, some, I, I think something changed in your life as well, that you suddenly... You've got all these babies and small children in the house. Um, the grandfather love kicked in, and and I saw these pictures on your Instagram. You sitting playing with the kids and enjoying mm -hmm. life, the small things in life, etc. And that is the moment I I saw changing. I saw your your writing changing, and also that you're much more into the cathedral thinking in another way than than the the futurist what you don't want to be but but what you do in your keynotes uh, it's, it's it also influences now. in what i do on my in my keynotes absolutely yeah, yeah, my now keynotes it's, are, now it's uh, in, the, the tone it's, the tone of my keynotes has changed yeah, yeah it's changed yeah um, yeah was that was that a decision or it, it, was it just you transforming and feeling differently and finding new kinds of love in life and, and, and reacting on that and doing something. I think it. it's, a, it's a pretty natural evolution, but it changes your point of view. Um, before that moment, you start, you, you, I was talking about the future, and, um, but detached from the future. I was talking mm -hmm. about the future, like yeah. I'm here and there's the future. When you have grandkids, all of a sudden you start to realize that the ones living next to you, the ones living with you, are the future. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden, your relationship with the future starts to change. Yes. Um, you're no longer talking about the future. Realize that we are the future and that whatever we do today is influencing our future. And in my keynotes, I refer to back to the future. And mm -hmm. then people think, okay, Rick is going to talk about the future, but I'm talking about the past. Because in that movie, that dates 1985. So if you say, yeah, uh, that means that you're old enough to have seen it in 1985. Yeah, Sorry for that, young guy. He was Yanka. my favorite yeah. actor at the time. Yeah. I dressed yeah. like him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did. Um, I dressed like Michael yeah, J. And, Fox. <laughs> and <laughs> I want to see that. I'm sorry. Um, That's, this is a coming out. I dressed like <laughs> okay. Michael J. Fox in the movies. <laughs> okay. So he traveled back to 1955. Mm -hmm. And when he's back in 1955, it, it, it is, it, 
it makes sense for us that he is afraid or that they are afraid to change something in 1955 because they know when they fly back to 1985, it will have influence on 1985. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And we all, we, we, when we see that, we all realize, yeah, of course, if you change something in 1955, 1985 might look different. Um, and then I say to people, why don't we realize that whatever we do today is going to impact how the world is going to look like in 2053, 30 years from now, because it's exactly the same. And when you have grandkids, all of a sudden you start to realize you that way realize more. That. Yeah. Yeah. I have an influence on how their future is going to look like, and we yeah. all have. Yeah. Does this responsibility um, frightens you? Strikes you? Um... It frightens me. It 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 frightens me to, and at the same time, it is. It, it frightens me, and at the same time, it has also freed up my mind to be less attached to who I am today. And to kind of get out of that rat race of today and to be much more in, okay, I'm only here. I'm, I'm, I'm not in transition, but we are in transition. We, we are just, and that is, um, tradition is a nice word because it, it, it comes from Latin. You, you give something to the next generation. Mm-hmm. Um, you trade on something and, that's a nice thought. Um, and at the same time, it is frightening that we have that responsibility. On the other hand, it also gives you, we constantly, we constantly, you know, making a fuzz around the why. And it's not even difficult to find the why, because that is the mm. why. That's why we're here. Yeah. Thank you. Um, last question to end. What can I wish you for the next 12 months? That's oh, not a long okay. time. <laughs> yeah, for next 12 months. What can I wish um, I was hoping that you would... Uh, for I, I wish, I really want to have another 30 years. Okay, that's that's my biggest wish. Just give me another 30 years. Um, there's plenty of things. It will be too short, but okay, give me another 30 years. In good health, um, mm-hmm. that's all I want. Yeah, that's a lot, but that's all I want. Yeah. Yeah. For the next 12 months, it's um, I want to finish my Net Curiosity book um, early that next year. That is a topic you have been talking quite a while. Uh, yeah, since 2000. Yeah. <laughs> 17 i think 2018 um and i think i touched upon something important and at the same time i was paralyzed by somebody Uh, i remember bringing it on stage i think it must have been end of 2018 and peter hins was in the room and um, i came off stage and peter said to me um that's the book you have to write now, when Peter says something, that can be very paralyzing. <laughs> so it yeah. paralyzed me a bit. Yeah. Um, but I'm, and, you know, it's not just writing a book because it's a book about the KPI. So you have to really think about how do I really turn this idea into a KPI, something that you can measure. And I'm not going to give away all the content of my book because it needs mm-hmm. to be a surprise. But I've, I've discovered quite a lot and I made it measurable. And that's why I created those extra characters because um, uh, I've been writing a couple of blogs, quite a lot, um, about how I hate KPIs. And then you come with a book with it with a KPI. <laughs> so um, I needed to create those characters to explain to myself why I hate KPIs and why, nevertheless, I come up with a new KPI. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting, because, of course, curiosity is one of my things that keeps me going. Um, and that's why we are having yeah. this, uh, this talk. Rick, um, let's discuss further, but without a microphone and without a camera. Yeah. And let's meet and, and go for a walk. Thank you for being yeah. my guest in this podcast. It was fun as usual. And I've, 
I'm, I'm, I'm going to rewatch it as well because I don't remember what exactly we've been talking about right now. But you can't edit. <laughs> I will not. No, 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 no. <laughs> I, I, I told you I would go with the flow. Yes, that's yeah. good. Thank you. And I don't have the feeling that I have been drowning, so I'm still alive no. and I'm still breathing. No, no, no. You, you, you stay decent and you said reasonable things. So thank you for that. Okay. That's that, okay. I said reasonable things. Okay. I don't know no, how that okay. sounds, but okay, that I'm sounds gonna okay. I'm going to cut off the recording now because. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.